Hi everyone, I'm Kevin Flood. I'm here to talk to you about automated space system architecture design. And what we're going to go through today is a walkthrough of a reference uh, architecture design utilizing some of the best practices that we here at AGI have uncovered in the course of our business. Uh, but before we go into some of the technical aspects of the architecture design, I thought it would be worthwhile to talk about some of the motivating drivers that we're seeing in the space community today that really set up the need to do these kind of designs a lot more quickly. So if we look at what's happening on the commercial side of the space business, we've seen an emergence of new and extravagant and comprehensive systems like we've never seen before in the space industry. New constellation designs, the delivery of new services, and there's absolutely an emphasis on being the first to market. So speed is absolutely paramount. If you look at the defense side of our business, the situation is pretty similar. And I think General Hyten captured it pretty effectively when he spoke at the last space symposium and said, if we're not moving faster than our threats, then whatever it is we're doing, it's wrong. It's just flat out wrong. So the need for speed in doing our space system architecture designs has never been more important. And it means that we have to think about doing things fundamentally differently. So as we contemplate what we're going to do differently, it's obvious that we ought to take a look at other technology sectors and learn from the successes that they've had. So we frequently look at industries like the internet software industry. And the internet software industry frequently uses the terminology that we build the plane while we're flying it. So before the concept is even fully baked, the product is launched and the producers of the product or the service are observing what's happening in the marketplace and adapting on the fly. And every two weeks, they come out with a new drop to update the system. And it would be really nice if we could utilize those same concepts for space systems, but unfortunately, because of the capital investment and the timelines involved in the physical systems, we can't do that exactly. But what we can do is use modeling and simulation to mimic that kind of design. We can build new technologies and new systems in a simulated fashion. We can test them out to provide new services and address new threats that we might conceive of, and we can do that iteration very rapidly. So that's the context for what it is we're going to talk about today. So in order to achieve new and better outcomes, let's benchmark where we are today. So there are only really a handful of steps that we go through in this modeling and simulation process, and the first is we build the model. So let's assume that process takes us about four weeks to build the fundamental underpinning, the point of departure that's going to represent our space system architecture. So we've got a couple of orbits, we need a constellation design, some mission payloads, some measures of effectiveness, and regions of interest that we care about. And that takes us four weeks to build that. Then we have to take that computer model and then we have to instrument it so that we can evaluate it over the control space that we want to consider and look at the measures of effectiveness. Now this is a pretty hefty computer problem, so it's going to take some time to run that trade study. So let's assume that the simulation then takes about a week or so. And then finally, we run this calculation and we have this multidimensional output that we then have to analyze and understand what does all this data mean. So assuming that takes about four weeks altogether, that took us about 11 weeks to go through that iteration, which isn't too bad in the time frames that we're thinking of, except that that was only our first iteration. And anybody who's been through this process knows that the first time you come through is really just the initial trial. And now you know what you really have to do. So you discover all of your errors the first time through, and you go back and you reset your system. And then you go through this 11-week process again. But then after that 11-week process, what you're going to discover is that there are particular regions in your control space that you care about more than others. And now you're going to zoom in and repeat that process again in those areas. And in the process of doing this through the first few iterations, you made some simplifying assumptions. And now you're getting down to more detailed analysis and you're saying, you know what? The simplifying assumptions just aren't accurate enough. I have to add some fidelity to the model. So you go in, you rebuild some models, and you do this process again. And now you got something that you can take to your customer, your internal customer, your external customer. And this always happens without fail, which is the results are highly appreciated. It provides insights. And now somebody's looking at it from a different perspective, and they're saying, 
you know what, what if you did the following? What if you looked at it this way? And so really just getting to this point where you can go back and readdress the second question took over a year. And that clearly doesn't meet the requirements for what we're trying to accomplish. So what does that mean we have to do with this fundamental process? Well, we have to take time spans that we're used to thinking of in the terms of weeks or months and reduce those down to days. So these are the kind of timelines that we're trying to achieve. And we're going to talk about some of the methods that we've learned about in the context of the space system architecture design to make this happen. Before we go on to the specific reference problem, I want to dive into one particular aspect of this, which is the simulation execution time. And the reason I want to do this is because we need to keep in mind the scope of these computational analyses, which can get pretty large. So again, let's break this down into basics. If we whittle this problem down into more or less the smallest number of control parameters that create a viable problem here, we can break it down to about nine parameters. So each orbit we can define with at least, well, a minimum of four parameters three more to describe the constellation design, and for the primary mission payload, there are going to be at least two parameters, something related to its geometry, something related to its resolution or performance quality. So we've got nine parameters. So if you just look at the basic uh, parametrics here, if we consider an analysis that only utilizes two values for each of these control parameters, and we do a full parametric scan, that's about well, not about, it is exactly, 512 uh, unique simulations. If we now increase the number of unique parameters to three, that number jumps dramatically to 65,000 or more unique simulations. And that's just for the minimum baseline problem that we're considering here. So 65,000 unique simulations to evaluate this trade space through one of those iterations. If you consider increasing the scope of this, say your constellation or your design incorporates multiple sub-constellations, two or three, these numbers grow exponentially. And recognize that you're looking at a log scale here. So these numbers get very big very quickly. And if you look inside any one of these simulations, you find that there are a lot of calculations that go on. So for a uh, for a scenario, the kind that we're considering here between 50 and 100 satellites looking at a distributed uh, set of target points, say 1,500, you're looking at at least uh, on the order of 100,000 unique access calculations. And then for each access calculation, you've got multiple measures of effectiveness. So we're going to have eight measures of effectiveness, and then over the simulation period, we're going to calculate several statistical properties. So for each simulation, of which there are hundreds to thousands, there are between half a million and a million unique calculations in the simulation. So I'm just trying to set the mindset in the context of having to move quickly that these computations are going to be large, and the fundamental calculation engines underneath need to be designed to address this kind of problem, and they need to be scalable. So with that as a background, let's get into the reference example so that we can talk about some of these things a, a little bit more uh, tangibly. So here's the reference scenario that we're going to use for this hypothetical uh, architecture study. Uh, we're going to look at a persist persistent surveillance mission, and we'll look at a design space composed of somewhere up to 100 satellites. And we'll look at two distributed sets of targets over two regions of interest. We'll take a global region of interest, and then a higher priority region, just so we can add some interest to this problem and look at some other factors. And for the sake of illustration here, we'll say that high priority region is uh, the US, uh, United States, continental US region. And then we'll grid those up uh, into about 1,500 grid points. And for each of the regions, we'll have four measures of effectiveness for system response time, for imaging resolution, for time between collections, and the number of uh, collections made on each target point. So we've got eight measures of effectiveness over those 1,500 target points, and we'll look at a 24-hour simulation period. So that's the scope of the reference example, and we're gonna go through all those processes that we just talked about in the previous slides to set this up. So in the conduct of our business as a provider of commercial software products uh, to many organizations solving this kind of problem, 
we've found that there are five key drivers to achieving speed and efficiency uh, as you try to solve these architectural design challenges. The first is the ability to build models rapidly. So that's the first and fundamental step, is to be able to represent your design concept in a computer model that's executable. That model then needs to be easily instrumented or automated so that it can be evaluated over a range of control parameters and evaluated over all the measures of effectiveness. We spent some time previously talking about how this needs to be scalable, so the computational underpinnings here need to operate efficiently for big problems. And then ultimately, you're going to get a ton of data out of this looking at many different competing factors, so multidimensional data. You need to have tools that take that data very quickly and give you insightful uh, conclusions that you can draw to understand what just happened and where I should go from here. And then after you complete that process, you're going to gradually go into incorporating higher fidelity models as you look at more and more individual design points. So ultimately, you want to be able to add those level, levels of higher fidelity or higher fidelity models into that same fundamental mission model without having to rebuild everything from scratch. So those are the five key points that we're going to emphasize here. We're going to walk through one cycle of that iteration for the first four steps, and then I'll talk very quickly about how we can bridge that fundamental mission model with models that incorporate levels of higher fidelity. So let me talk, start with uh, the rapid building of the mission model. So again, we're doing a constellation design here, and we need to create our fundamental point of departure. So the first thing to know is that it's always most efficient to start with existing models wherever they, uh, wherever they exist. So what you see happening here is a lookup in a database for existing satellite models that might be good starting points for our uh, orbital design. And these could be models of existing systems or other models that you may have built in the practice of your business and have just retained. If that's not possible, the most important thing is to get to that starting point quickly. So having tools like this, which are wizard-like, that allow you to pick that starting point very efficiently to get that process started are the next best option if, you're not avail or if you don't have the ability to draw from an existing database. Once those models are in place, a, an absolute critical aspect is that all these models are data-driven. That is, all of the defining parameters are available for variation as you go through the trade study analysis, which is being shown by this property panel here. Then, uh, after creating the system definition, it's really important to be able to add your measures of mission effectiveness. And in our case, these are distributed measures, so you see simple gridding tools that allow you to create the grids over all your regions of interest. The global region, a US region, a region of selected points that you see here. And these, in order to be as applicable as possible, have to be defined in the most flexible way, which means they can't just be points on the ground or uh, constrained geometrically in any way. So what you see being illustrated here is the ability to do that same type of gridding very rapidly over a distributed region through space, uh, in the airspace, on the ground, uh, and in any dimension. And then finally, for each of those grid points, we have to add measures of mission effectiveness. So again, the first and foremost uh, criterion is to have your most important measures of effectiveness already available to you in some way. This is one that I like to uh, point out early on in the process, which is the system response time. It's a good starting point that incorporates a lot of good engineering assumptions for, so you can do good first order analysis and then replace this model later on with models of higher fidelity as you want to dig into each of those parameters a little more closely. Ultimately, you want to ensure also that you can include any type of model. So the ability to have models that you build that represent your special sauce in your business and incorporate them in a co-simulation fashion in this type of simulation engine is also critical so that you know that you have the expandability, extensibility to uh, do any type of measure of mission effectiveness that you might need. So those are some of the fundamental aspects that go into the tools to build those models. And when we did this process for this reference example, it took us about four hours to go through this process. And again, that entailed the following steps. We built two 
uh, orbital designs that represent seed satellites for our constellation designs. We defined the sensor geometries. We built the mission geography using those gridding tools that uh, we illustrated here. And then we applied the measures of mission effectiveness. Now, in full transparency, the engineers who did this were very skilled in this tool and they're very skilled in this area. So and other question that needs to be asked when you get around to evaluating can we do this process quickly and efficiently is how quickly can I cha train my staff, my engineers, to use the tools uh, that you're utilizing here. So that is a question that needs to go along with the tools themselves. But in general, this type of tool can be learned rapidly and used to create a model like this in the span of about four hours, not four weeks. All right, so the next step then is to instrument this model so that we can do the trade study analysis. And again, what we want to do here is connect to those control parameters. We want to set up the scope of the variation, and then we want to automate the design process. So one thing that's important is that your model subscribe to open standards that can be utilized by any tool that you might want to use. So what you see here is a MATLAB environment being used to connect to those control parameters, taking advantage of uh, IntelliSense so that just about any engineer familiar with MATLAB can automate this type of system. However, if you don't want to do this through scripting, what you can also use are tools that are automatically connected to the mission model. So in this case, what you're going to see is something like a drag and drop environment. So you see on the left panel, all of our simulation entities, which are the sources for our parametric variation available. And as you click on any one, all of the control parameters are exposed. So now somebody without any scripting experience can identify what those control parameters are and bring them into the design space. And that applies to the vehicles, the sensors, and the constellation designs as well. And we want to do the same sort of thing for um, the measures of mission effectiveness. So here you see the gridded regions, and we can pick the parameters and the measures of effectiveness that we care about. You see that you have uh, options to look at the statistical outputs for each of these that you like. And again, it's a simple point and click, drag and drop uh, creation of the trade space. And really what we're doing here is just identifying the scope of the parametric variation for our trade study analysis. What you see illustrated here is the depth to which you would like to be able to go for each of these parameters. So if I cared about a, the altitude constraints on a, an, a, an individual satellite, I can go to that level of detail. With that defined, the next thing we need to do is define what the scope or range of the variation is going to be. And this can actually be, at this point, a different engineer from the constellation designer. So they're actually bringing in the control parameters here, and now we're defining what the bounds on that variation can be, so that a system engineer without explicit knowledge of the details of the system can safely run these trade studies without violating any fundamental constraints. And you'll see here, if we do a full parametric scan and you're looking closely at the number of iterations, it's somewhere over 700. Another important thing is to have integrated smart sampling parameters. Parametric scans in general for continuous variables are not necessary and a pretty inefficient way to do things. So if you paid attention, we reduced the number of iterations there through the sampling algorithm from more than 700 to fewer than 30, which is a great time savings. And now what we're doing is we're bringing in all of the different measures of mission effectiveness, and then we have our trade study fully designed. The final step is to ensure that this kind of tool connects automatically to your mission model so that you can, without any other uh, scripting or interface uh, machinations, just run that trade study. And what you see happening here is the mission model being executed in an automated fashion through the first iteration of that trade study to create the constellation from the seed satellites, to apply the sensor geometries that were defined in that trade space evaluation, and then to perform the calculation of the measures of mission effectiveness over the global region of interest and the US region of interest. So again, this is just a rapid walkthrough of the fundamental things that are in, uh, required in order to automate a model and execute a trade study. And again, what we're focusing on here is doing this quickly, setting it up quickly and making sure that it can execute efficiently. When we did this for this uh, reference case, 
This took us about four hours as well. So in the span of a business day, we were able to create the mission model, we were able to define the trade space, and run the first iteration of the trade space analysis. So now let's talk about uh, the execution of the trade study. So there are several things that are really important in the execution. So first of all, the tools that you're using need to be uh, designed to solve the kind of problem that you're looking at. There's no getting around trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. So if you're trying to force fit a tool to do a job it wasn't intended to do, ultimately you're going to pay the price. And these kinds of problems are significant enough that you'll see that issue right away. So in our case, we chose a computational engine that was designed from the ground up to solve these kind of problems that incorporate the ability to rapidly propagate orbits, layer all of the geometri geometrical transformation, do the gridded calculations, and apply layer constraints so that we can calculate measures of mission effectiveness. Additionally, because of the scale of the problem, we want to ensure that we can take advantage of computational resources. So we want to ensure that we can utilize distributed computing wherever it makes sense. When we ran this, we just used a single engineering grade laptop computer and took advantage of the multiple cores on, on that machine. Um, however, at some point, it's very likely that this kind of problem is going to require cloud computing or some other high computing, uh, high performance computing system. So uh, the tools that we've chosen in this case had already been demonstrated in that type of environment for uh, highly scalable solutions. And then the final step in our process is now to take the results of that calculation and understand what happened and set ourselves up for the next iteration. So this is where we need to have a series of insightful analysis tools to help us look through this multidimensional data. And the fundamental things that are required are to ensure that the data is easily importable into the system and that we have the right kind of tools to analyze the data and look at different aspects of interest. So what you see here are a series of what are called tornado plots that for each control parameter look at the sensitivity of the various outputs. These help us identify risk areas. And there are a lot of techniques that are available to evaluate multidimensional data. So here you see a 3D graphical component uh, that allows you to look at three different dimensions of data to incorporate another dimension as a color code and has useful attributes like the ability to individually evaluate data points within your data set and to be able to dig into each one of those. So you could actually spend days or weeks just going through some of the techniques uh, available to do this. I'd just like to go through one here, which is uh, one that I like to use, which is just simply start with a scatter plot in a two-dimensional uh, nature. So what we're looking at here is the average resolution in our high area region of interest uh, in the United States and cost along the bottom axis. And what we just showed is the creation of the Pareto front, the most important points, the highest uh, effectivity points along the bottom. Now, frequently with the multidimensional data, there will be aspects of your response parameters that just simply aren't acceptable. So using features like this that allow you to go in and choose some of those other uh, response parameters that aren't graphed here and simply take out unacceptable points becomes a useful feature. So what you see here is our filtering out points that are too expensive and others that are underperforming in other measures of effectiveness that we didn't include in the graph. Now that we've necked down our problem a little bit, we can zoom in and we can start identifying those areas that we want to focus in on for our next series of iterations. Um, what we'll do now is we'll look at only those most important points. So I mentioned the Pareto front uh, when we first set up those, uh, the graph. And these are the points that are optimal along that bottom curve. And if you go into any one of those, you can pick the point that now becomes the center for your next iteration and your next trade study analysis. And you can simply incorporate that back into your uh, trade study tool as the starting point for uh, your analysis. So again, the idea here is to take multidimensional data and to evaluate it so that you can understand what happened, understand the relationship between the control parameters, and understand where you should go next uh, with, and avoid areas of risk. So with that process, it took us about a day to go through 
the collection and analysis of the data. And really, the collection of the data took no time at all because essentially this is all one integrated framework. What took some time was the human analysis of the data and understanding which parameters we should plot against which others and interpreting what the data meant. So essentially, in the span of less than a business week, we went through an entire cycle of that process. So what we'd like to do now is to look at what comes next. After we've been through this process and we've evaluated the first and second order conditions, how do we move on and identify the aspects that are more important as we bring in high levels of higher fidelity or even move beyond the architecture design phase and start deriving requirements for the systems engineering process. So that's where we want to bring in models of different fidelities. So I'm going to quickly go through some of the models that can be easily incorporated into this mission model. Uh, and we'll talk about some of the factors that they bring to bear in this process. So first of all, uh, I talked about one of the measures of mission effectiveness being the system response time. Um, and I like to use the example that we had uh, in our reference case because it makes some good engineering assumptions. But essentially, at some point, you want to get beyond that and incorporate more detailed descriptions for how the system interoperates and how uh, your measures of effectiveness are generated. So it's important to have tools that allow you to define those very accurately. And all measures of mission effectiveness are composed of four things. Position, where the target is, for example. The direction, the direction that I'm looking, the direction of a sun angle. Um, the time at which things occur, and specific calculated values. So you need a tool that calculates all four of those things and lets you combine them easily in order that you can do, can do something like that. Another area that we'll need to look into a little more closely is the availability of resource or resources or resource scheduling. So commonly in first order analysis, we assume resources are available, that we aren't going to have constraints. That's almost never the case, so being able to incorporate a scheduling and a tasking optimization engine as part of this is critical. And that's one of the tools and one of the model capabilities that ought to be able to fit in in the incorporation uh, of higher levels of detail into these mission models. Same thing for communications modeling uh, at different levels of fidelity all the way down to the design and the operation of the antenna if you're using phased arrays, the incorporation of beam forming algorithms. And also the, the vehicle performance. So we gave no consideration in our first order analysis to the vehicle itself. We created it and considered it only as an orbit. But all of the key subsystems on the satellite system ought to be incorporated to evaluate things like the power collection and what the driving requirements are going to be as you consider moving from the constellation design into the vehicle design. We talked about the sensor mostly from a geometric and resolution perspective, but also the fundamental physics of the sensor are important. And again, remember what we're trying to do here. We're trying to consider missions that may not be the initial primary mission. So if, for example, you have a visible imaging sensor intended for use for ground surveillance, and all of a sudden you want to reapply your system to do space surveillance, having a physics-based simulation of your sensor system is absolutely critical in this level of analysis. Um, same applies for the ground system. Again, we didn't give much consideration to the ground system in our first order design, but looking at the number of ground stations that are required, the kind of hardware that's going to be needed in order to provide uh, the orbital estimation fidelity are key components that have to be incorporated into this mission analysis at some point. The environmental effects, as you consider the lifetime of your system, become very important, and then uh, the ground system design as well. So these are all aspects that can be incorporated into this kind of model that we illustrated in the first order analysis. So in summary, what we talked about is a technique to perform automated space system architecture design, particularly in the context of what we're seeing in the community right now, which is to dramatically accelerate the speed with which we conduct these kinds of studies and convert times that we're used to measuring in months and weeks down to days. Um, this is readily accomplished by taking advantage of tools that are already in place 
and optimized to perform this kind of function. And the five key areas that we identified uh, over the years of our being involved in this are being able to build those models very rapidly, instrument and automate those models, ensure that the execution of the simulations are very scalable, ensure that we have good insightful analysis tools so we can understand the results that the models produce, and ensure that we can transition from each phase of the process by adding models of higher and higher fidelity without having to go back and rebuild the fundamental mission model. So when we did this, uh, clearly uh, we, we are going to use our tools. So these are some of the tools that were used. In the first part of the analysis for the trade study, we used SDK Professional, SAT Pro for the orbit propagation, the SDK Analysis Workbench, which helped us define some of the key uh, measures of mission effectiveness, the coverage tool that allows us to rapidly grid ground-based uh, points of interest, SDK Analyzer for the automated trade study, and then we incorporated other third-party tools. We also did the trade study automation using MATLAB, which we showed in the video, and we used a .NET plugin to illustrate how you can incorporate your own models and uh, your, your own computational tools into this kind of simulation. For the specialized tools, all the areas of specialization that we just went through are illustrated here. So the analysis workbench is that Uber tool that allows you to define position, orientation, time, and calculation so that you can get any measure of mission effectiveness. Scheduler for tasking and scheduling, the communications model for the comm system uh, design and analysis, SDK Solus for the satellite and key subsystem design, SDK EOIR for the physics-based sensor modeling, SDK Astrogator for station keeping and fuel consumption analysis, SDK SEAT for the environmental analysis, and the orbit determination toolkit for the ground station analysis and the uh, orbital prediction analysis. So hopefully this was a good uh, enlightening, enlightening insight into conducting architecture trade studies. And if you want to see more about any of these tools or learn more about this process, come visit us on our website.